Welcome again, everybody, to Lunch with Littman Crooks. My name is Brian Miller, and today we're going to be discussing planning with revocable trusts. Um, I do remind people that you do not have to make your video um, uh, seen. You can stay behind your black screen with your name or whatever you want um, on there. You do not need to um, show your video if you do not wish. Today's video will be recorded, and if you'd like a copy of the recording, contact our office and we'll be, we'll be able to provide it to you if you're um, a, a little late straggler. We do these lunch with Littman Crooks um, once, a, once a week, usually every Tuesday at 12 o'clock, um, with the exception of next Tuesday, we are taking a break for Election Day. Uh, so I'd like to remind everybody uh, to, to get out there and vote. It is a presidential election. Uh, the next Lunch with Litman Crooks will be the following Tuesday, November 10th at 12 o'clock. We'll be discussing mental health and the law um, with regard to guardianships and, and planning states for people with incapacities and, and mental deficiencies. Again, today we're going to be discussing planning with revocable trusts. I'm going to start with a little just general overview of estate planning in general and then get into a little the more specifics uh, of revocable trusts. If you have any questions, feel free to type your questions in the chat box um, at the bottom and at the end of the presentation, I'll go through the chats and answer as many questions as possible. Um, and perhaps we'll even have a little time to open up some Q&A um, of live questions if, if possible. I'm going to try and keep this Rather, rather short, as I know as many people are on their lunch hours, and so I want to get it done within a half hour to an hour and uh, don't want to belabor the point. So planning with revocable trusts. Well, when you're doing your estate planning, you always want to start with, well, what are your estate planning goals? Most, for most people, um, they want to pr protect their assets for their spouse or their children or family or loved ones. Um, many people want to minimize or eliminate um, their taxes, their estate taxes, if any that are due. Uh, quite often we have a lot of clients come in, they want to avoid the courts, they want to avoid probate, um, or want to avoid guardianship and, and really engage in their estate planning to try and keep everything out of the courts as much as possible because with courts comes attorneys and with attorneys comes attorney fees. Um, Many people do their estate planning to prepare for their incapacity. And when you hear estate, you think, oh, well, when I pass away. But also it, with estate planning, we do prepare for somebody that's alive but maybe incapacitated and need to, to provide for their loved ones and help with management of their, their assets. And then finally, the biggest thing I hear from many of our clients with their estate planning goals is just to have a peace of mind, just to know that at the end of the day, when we executed all their documents, they have their wills, their powers of attorney, their trusts, whatever those documents may be in place, they, they, they could take a deep sigh of relief and say, oh, good, I'm protected if something were to happen to me. So when you do work with your estate planning, you, you want to work with a professional. And, and I find it's very necessary to work with an elder law attorney or a trust and estate attorney, somebody that does this type of work day in and day out. And, and the reason why, there's many reasons. One is the tax laws are constantly changing. And so elder law or, or trust and estates attorneys, we're, we're apprised of these changes in the tax laws. We see what the proposed laws are, are, are coming down the pike and start being able to plan and prepare our, our clients' estates for the constantly changing laws. Uh, you want to engage in proper asset protection. I've had many clients come in and say, oh, I've got this trust or I've got that trust, thinking that it protects them, but it does not. And, and so somebody that does this day in and day out knows how to best protect you, your family, your loved ones, and your assets. Um, poorly drafted documents can dispose of property in a manner that is unintended by the client. And many clients come in again with their doc with their documents saying, well, it's protected and everything's going to my child. And then when we re read uh, the details of their plans that were done maybe by a general practitioner or maybe even done off legal Zoom, printed offline, it, it does not provide for what they intended. And so having a professional um, develop your estate plans and, and really does help meet your goals and your needs. Um, Proper planning also by an elder law or trust and six attorney plans for your incapacity. So that way somebody can uh, prepare, uh, take over and help you manage your assets um, should you lose capacity at some point in the future. Also proper planning with professional avoids costly litigation 
while not all litigation can be avoided, it avoids a, a great majority of, of the litigation if, if the documents are done properly, done correctly, um, and avoids future attorney fees later on. And then finally, uh, this is a very important one. When working professional, you're ensuring the proper execution of your documents. Uh, again, many people print their documents off legal Zoom or one of these online, prepare your own DIY wills, trusts. Um, there are specific rules and specific laws as to how each document has to be executed. And if not executed properly, uh, the document itself is invalid. So that's why you really want to work with a professional when engaging in your estate planning. So when we talk about estate planning, we want to look at some, some of the important concepts for today's um, discussion. First, there's the, the growth of state. That's the overall uh, your estate. That's everything that passes through your will, through a trust, um, through joint property, through operation of law. This is everything that you have in your name at the time of your passing. And that growth estate can be um, broken down into two other categories. One is the non-probate assets. Those are the assets that pass outside of your will, or if you don't have a will, pass through and test to see. These are assets such as joint property that you may you may own a home with your spouse or, or, or with a or with a partner. Uh, you may own it as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, which means that when somebody passes, it automatically goes to the survivor. That's a non-probate asset because it doesn't go through your will. Um, quite often, retirement accounts become non-probate assets so long as you have uh, beneficiaries listed on that account. Another non-probate asset would be trusts because they generally pass outside of the courts um, by operation of law to your beneficiaries. And then finally, uh, another uh, non-probate asset we see often are, are bank accounts, financial accounts, investment accounts where either you have beneficiaries named or you own it jointly with somebody and then they pass by operation of law. Everything else that, that doesn't pass by operation of law, that doesn't have a named beneficiary, um, that is solely in your name and not jointly owned with somebody else would be your probate assets. These are the assets that pass through your will um, and through the courts. And if you don't have a will, then that's considered intestacy or it passes by the rules and the laws set up by, by those up in Albany that created our state plans for people that pass away without a will. So when I say probate assets. I'm referring both to assets that pass through your will if you have a will or assets that pass through the rules of intestacy if you don't have a will. So when you engage in your, your, your estate planning, there you need to do some fact gathering and, and some thoughts and look into your own, your own assets and maybe even talk with your family members um, okay. to engage in that type of of uh, uh, estate planning. So with fact gathering, you wanna look into what do you own? Do you own a house? Do you own a car? Do you own a timeshare, a bank account, uh, IRA, retirement account? What are your assets? What are the types of the assets that you have? Who is the owner or, or what's on the title? Um, is it a vehicle? Is it leased? Then you don't own it, but if it's outright is your name on that title is your spouse's name on that title mm -hmm. so you want to look at the type of assets you have who the owner is if there is a joint owner how that joint owner is titled is it with rights of survivorship um, or is it in with regard to like real property tenants in common so that way even when you pass you still own your certain percentage of that property and therefore your estate owns a certain percentage of the property you want to look at the value of these assets. And value is important because there are there are um, estate tax laws that come into play. Uh, and right now, the estate taxes are, are quite high. For federal, um, a person can pass away in 2020 um, with an overall gross estate of $11.58 million before um, estate taxes come into play. However, in New York, we have a lower, it's still reasonably high, but a lower threshold of $5.85 million. So you could pass away um, with an estate in New York of New York assets up to $5.85 million before one would have to pay an estate tax. In New York, there is no inheritance tax and there is no gift tax, but there is an estate tax for, for estates valued over $5.85 million. And where we have spouses 
Um, maybe you have an estate larger than 5.85, maybe you have a $10 million estate. There are estate tax um, planning opportunities to avoid having to pay um, a state tax where you have legally married spouses and something that you'd wanna discuss with your estate planning attorney. Another thing you want to look at when you're doing your fact gathering is, are you entitled to any inheritances? Do you anticipate mom or dad passing away or maybe great, great aunt Tilly uh, may have left you something and you've been told that you're gonna be getting an inheritance? Because these inheritance eventually will become your property and something you want to consider when doing your own estate planning um, to, to protect that asset and to protect any taxes that may be owed. You want to discuss, you want to look into disabilities, not just your disabilities, but disabilities of your family, friends, and loved ones, whoever um, you may want to leave money or, or, or property to upon your passing. The last thing you would want to do is, is leave money outright to a child who has a disability, maybe receiving government benefits, and when they receive that inheritance, um, it knocks them off their government benefits. You're able to, in in, in doing your estate planning, set up, setting up your revocable trusts, plan for their incapacities to ensure that they're still able to receive government benefits um, and that you, your assets are, are being there to provide for them, but not just going outright to the state either. Another thing you wanna do in your, your fact gathering is figure out what your goals are. Is your goal to leave your money to your children? To, to provide for your spouse, to provide for a charity, a combination. Uh, and it's a, a sometimes a, a tough decision to make because you're, you're looking at your mortality and say, when I pass away, what do I want to happen with my assets? Um, but you're also looking at, while I'm here, what do I want to happen with my assets um, to, pro to protect for and provide for me um, while I'm alive? And then the, one of the biggest fact gathering things that clients go back and forth on is who do you trust? Because you're going to be asking somebody to step in and be a trustee of your trust or, or be an executor of your estate or be a guardian of your minor children. So you, it really is um, a time for some internal thought as to who do I trust and who, are go, who is that person I could trust to fulfill my goals. And so that's some of the fact gathering you want to, to, to look into um, as you're doing your estate planning and getting ready to prepare for revocable trusts. Some of the common estate planning tools, and I know this is about, again, I said revocable trust primarily, but I do wanna go through the, the general overall estate planning. Um, so this way you're, under, you're aware that it's not just the trust, but there are other documents that are necessary in your estate planning portfolio. And some of the common estate planning tools are your last will and testament. This is a document that will provide for this distribution of your estate upon your passing. There's trusts, there's irrevocable and revocable trusts. And I'll get into the difference between those two in a minute. There's joint property. Uh, that's where you own property jointly with somebody else and they may or may not have a right of survivorship. Um, there's beneficiary designations. Many of us have retirement accounts or some of us even have um, investment accounts with beneficiaries designated on them. And that's a, another common estate planning tool to make sure that your assets are, are given to your family or loved ones. Life insurance is a common estate planning tool. Uh, it's insurance on your life or, or a loved one's life and upon your or that person's passing, the money is left um, to you or, or one of your loved ones. And then one of the most important um, tools in the estate planning portfolio is your advanced directives, your power of attorney. This is where you appoint an agent to be able to make financial decisions for you while you're alive. Your healthcare proxy. This is a document where you're able to appoint an agent to make healthcare decisions for you while you're alive, should you no longer be able to make those healthcare decisions for yourself. There's the living will. This is a document that I call it the instructions to the healthcare proxy. Uh, this is where you tell your healthcare agent that if I'm in an ir incurable or irre irreversible condition, pull the plug, don't pull the plug, give me treatment, don't give me treatment. You can really tailor it to what your needs are. That's why I, I call it the, the instructions to the healthcare proxy. There's the, the liver, there's the HIPAA release. This allows your agent to obtain your medical records. Um, God forbid something happens to you and somebody needs to uh, see what your history is to make a, a, an educated decision on, on what is best treatment for you, the HIPAA release will allow your agent to obtain your medical records. 
there's the appointment of an agent to control disposition of remains. This is the document where you will appoint an agent to uh, essentially set up your funeral planning and, and dispose of your remains in accordance with your wishes. And then one of the other documents that our firm does is an access to electronically stored information, or I sometimes call it the authorization for digital assets. Uh, this is a document that will allow your agent to obtain your electronically stored information, your emails, your your, your YouTube account or things of that nature. I mean, I've had a couple clients in here that are photographers and so they have their own websites and it allows um, them to their agent to access the, those digitally or electronically stored um, databases. So now what we came here for today, what is a trust? A trust is a legal agreement between three parties for the management of assets. The settlor, or sometimes called the grantor, is the individual who creates the trust. The trustee is one or more individuals or a trust company is in certain times that manages the assets transferred into the trust. And the beneficiary is the individual who receives the benefits of the trust. So those are the three, three important parties of trust, the settlor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. And when dealing with revocable trusts, quite often they could all be the same person. You can be the settlor of your own trust, the trustee of your own trust while you're alive and have capacity, and the beneficiary of your trust, that you receive the benefits of the trust. So then what are the types of trusts? Is there's, there's two types of trusts um, with regard to creating a trust inter vivos, which means creating while you're alive. Um, this trust can be revocable or irrevocable. And the other type of trust is a testamentary trust. And this is a trust that's created after your death uh, through your last will and testament. And it's often supervised by the court until the trust is terminated at some point in time in the future. And a testamentary trust is always irrevocable. And it's irrevocable because you're no longer here with us to revoke your own trust. So going into revocable versus irrevocable trusts. An irrevocable trust is created for various reasons. Often we do these for Medicaid planning, special needs or disability planning, um, asset protection planning, creditor debtor protection planning, tax planning, spendthrift protection. Uh, these are trusts, again, they cannot be revoked, although there is a caveat to that. There is a little loophole where quite often we draft these provisions so that they can be re revoked if needed to, but, but you never want to prepare these trusts, to these irrevocable trusts to revoke them. Um, when an individual transfers an asset to the irrevocable trust, for the most part, they cannot then change the terms of the trust or retain total control over the assets. Uh, we use these often when we do Medicaid planning, maybe we'll transfer a house into it that allows a person to live, remain, use, occupy their house, um, but upon their passing, it passes through the trust um, and, and, and the principal stays with the trust and then distributed to somebody's loved ones. The other type of trust other than an irrevocable trust is the revocable trust, which is the corpus of our discussion today. The revocable trust often sometimes is called a living trust. Um, these are created dur during the settler's lifetime um, and generally typically serves, uh, the settler serves as the trustee and often usually serves as the, the initial beneficiary of the trust during his or her lifetime. Uh, you can have, I've done some of these where uh, it, the, the, the settlor is their own trustee, maybe they have their spouse as a co-trustee, and they and their spouse are the initial beneficiaries, but then provide for their family or loved ones um, after their demise. And while the settlor is living, the trust can be amended or revoked property could be transferred into or out of the trust at any time. And all of the trust property remains in control, the settler of you, the person that creates the trust. Uh, I often tell clients that it's, it's akin to taking money out of your right pocket and putting it into your left pocket. Uh, you generally will not feel a difference between um, your assets when they're out of the re revocable trust and they're in the revocable trust, but it does offer protections which we're gonna really get into um, with regard to the revocable trust. So the basics of revocable trusts. You are in control. Um, quite often, you are the trustee. You're the beneficiary. You can do with do as you want with the with the assets that are in the trust. 
you can amend or revoke the trust at any time. If there's certain terms you don't like, uh, maybe you in your trust you say, upon my demise, I wanna leave 25% of my estate to XYZ charity. And then for some reason, you no longer like XYZ charity. While you're alive, you can amend, amend and revoke that provision or any other provision of the trust. Um, these these uh, trusts are tax neutral. Generally, we use your own social security number. So any money coming in, any money created by the trust, any dividends or, or income created by the trust, um, by any investments would go, would be taxed at your own tax rate. Um, you're not, they're not being taxed at the, 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 the trust tax rate. And one of the most important things of these revocable trusts is they cover all three phases of your life. Um, they protect you while you're healthy, they protect you when you become incapacitated, should you become incapacitated, and then they protect you when you die. So protecting somebody while they're healthy. Well, not much changes again in your day-to-day -day life. Like I said, it's like taking money from your right pocket, putting it to your left pocket. While you're healthy, you could be your own trustee, you could handle your assets, you could manage your assets, um, you could change the terms of the trust, you could spend your money um, however you wish. You could uh, go to the store, buy a living room furniture set, you could go on vacation, do whatever you want with your assets as if you, you, you were the owner, because technically you still are the owner. You still file the same tax returns, um, but the most important thing is that you have to fund the trust. The trust could only control the assets that you funded the trust with. So if you have a bank account or, or, or an investment account and it's in your own individual name, that's out of the control of the trust. But if you change the, the title of that account to the John Smith Revocable Trust, then that is within the control of the trust and you as a trustee um, could, could handle those assets, but also any other co-trustees can handle those assets or any successor trustees, should you become incapacitated, be able to handle those assets. So that's when I get into, well, what are the benefits um, of, of a revocable trust while you're incapacitated? Well, the trust provides a mechanism to transition to a tr successor trustee if you're suffering, suffering an incapacity. So perhaps you, you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia. You're, you're still physically with us, but mentally perhaps you have an incapacity and can no longer meet your, your needs and provide for yourself and manage your affairs. The, the trust would be drafted with a successor trustee, somebody that would step in as the, the trustee of the trust when you're no longer able to manage um, your, your assets. And they would be able to manage those assets while you're alive. Then the, the revocable trust is also readily accepted by financial institutions. Uh, so long as you, you change the title of your account to the John Smith revocable trust, the trustee, the new trustee, successor trustee comes in, it's accepted by the financial institution, by the bank, and they're able to continue managing your property while you're alive, but unfortunately incapacitated. Um, the revocable trust provides detailed instructions and directions um, to your successor trustee of how to manage um, or invest or, or, or care for your, your assets. And these instructions and directions are generally more detailed than what you would find in your typical power of attorney. Um, the, the, these detailed instructions really lay out what they can and cannot do with your assets while they are acting as trustee, whereas the power of attorney generally just provides people with the powers, but does not give the instructions as how to handle those, the, your assets. And finally, uh, the, success, the revocable trust will hold the, the successor trustee to a higher fiduciary standard than the power of attorney. So they, they actually have an obligation, a fiduciary obligation to invest your assets, to manage your assets, uh, to make sure that you, you are being provided for, or your assets are being well taken care of. And then comes revocable trusts at your death. We discussed how they're, they're beneficial while you're alive, beneficial uh, while you're alive and incapacitated, but then they're able to provide for at your death. And this is where tr revocable trusts often um, 
they almost act like a will in that they do provide for distribution of your assets upon your passing. However, it avoids probate um, in the state of your residence or the state where your property is held. So it, your house is held in a, in a revocable trust, or your bank accounts are held in a revocable trust. They do not pass through your will, so it avoids probate, which means it avoids um, a, a attorney's fees and allow and it also allows for the near immediate distribution of your assets um, you're able to say upon my passing i leave everything to my children upon your passing the trust can then just they don't have to file a will with the court or do any seek court approval they can dispose of those assets upon your passing it also allows for you to kind of control your assets after your passing maybe you have um children that they're they're adults, they're 18, 19 years old, but you don't want them to have that money until they're 25, 35, whatever that may be. It allows for you to put in protections to, to hold these assets, maybe provide for your children in their younger ages, but not distribute the entire corpus of their, of their inheritance until they're older, um, where you feel, okay, they're now, they should be mature by 30 or 35, whatever, and then they can have the the distribution of my inheritance so that way they wouldn't waste it. So it does provide for you to control your assets after your death. The use of a revocable after your trust after your death also benefits in that if you were to pass away and you have an, a minor child or an incapacitated distributee, the court may have to appoint what we call a guardian ad litem to protect their interests. Um, this is generally a, a, another attorney that, that stands in the shoes of your minor child or incapacitated uh, or disabled beneficiary to make sure that everything is um, properly protected and, and, and nobody is taking advantage of, of, of this distributee. With that guardian litem comes a cost and then that cost is going to be borne by the estate, um, which means less money to be distributed amongst everybody else. Because the trust passes outside of the court, guardian ad litems generally are not required for the beneficiaries who are minors or have disabilities. Again, with the, with the revocable trust, saves legal fees, it avoids the probate, um, it avoids quite often the contesting uh, uh, of a will. Trusts are a little harder to contest because they're out of, out of the public realm. As I noted, the successor trustee can act immediately, does not need or require court, court appointment to act. Revocable trusts at your death generally are private. They're not public documents. Uh, maybe, maybe you are a private person or you don't want all of your family members knowing what your assets are or who you're leaving your assets, you want to disinherit somebody or who you're leaving your assets to. You, the use of revocable trusts quite often are, are used for privacy concerns. And you see quite often um, you'll hear some celebrity passed away and left everything in a trust. And then we never know anything else about it because it's not a public document like a will. Um, the use of revocable trust will also minimize will contests. Um, when you file a, when you prepare a will and you have no trust and everything passes through your will, it's a public document filed with the court. Anybody can see what goes on and any of your beneficiaries, anybody that would take it um, or inherit under your state if you had no will, um, would have a chance to then review that will and object to the will, whereas the revocable trust avoids um, many of those, those issues. And again, and I can't stress this enough, it minimizes the delay of the transfer of your assets to your beneficiaries because there is no court involvement. And while I mentioned, and I keep mentioning it, it avoids the will, we still always do prepare a will anyway. And we call this a pour over will. And what the pour over will does, it essentially says that any assets that I have in my name that don't have a beneficiary, that don't pass by operation of law, that are not in a trust, should be distributed to my trust and then from my trust um, pursuant to the terms of the trust. And we do this kind of as a catch-all. Perhaps there's an account out there that you forgot about um, that was not transferred into the trust. Or perhaps you um, came into an, an inheritance or came into some types of monies um, but did not have time to transfer them to your trust before your own demise. Um, the pour over will captures all of those assets um, that may be in your name uh, at your death and then we'll then distribute them to the terms of the trust. So the considerations for when you're preparing 
in your revocable trust. First is the time and the cost to set up and fund the trust. It's something you want to consider. You want to look at the value of your estate. You want to look at um, who would take your estate um, if you had a will, who would take your estate if you didn't have a will. It, it, it is a cost-benefit analysis and make sure that it, that it is uh, a plan that works for you and your particular family situation. Um, another consideration is the revocable trust does not protect against estate taxes. So if you have more than $5.85 million in the state of New York or $11.58 million for federal state taxes, if it's in the revocable trust, it does not protect against the estate taxes. But there are techniques and planning techniques that may be available in conjunction with the revocable trust to help minimize um, some of those estate taxes if you're in the upper echelon uh, uh, of decedents. Revocable trusts do not protect against Medicaid. And I can't stress this enough. I have had many, many, many clients come in and say, I need to apply for Medicaid for mom. She's good, she's in a nursing home, but we're good because we put her house into a trust um, a couple of years ago and we're good. And I look at it and I said, well, this is a revocable trust and does not protect and Medicaid can put a lien on that house because of the type of trust it is. So if you have a trust and you think it protects you against Medicaid, you, you want to, uh, engage with an elder law attorney to make sure that that trust really does meet your goals and it is the type of trust that you think it is because, because revocable trusts do not protect against Medicaid. The one thing they do protect against though is at, at, at this time at least is Medicaid estate recovery because Medicaid um, when somebody passes away is requ required to seek recovery for any monies they've spent on that decedent's medical care while they were alive from their estate. And right now in New York, they could only recover against probate assets and not, and so therefore trusts, which are non-probate assets, are outside of Medicaid's grips. Um, so in, in certain situations, we use it not to protect the asset against Medicaid, but to protect it against Medicaid estate recovery. But those are very specific planning techniques which you'd want to speak with an elder law attorney with um, about your, your own um, specific scenarios. Another consideration for revocable trust is the successor trustee. Quite often, uh, a person or a person and their spouse or a person and their child are, are trustees during your life. Um, but who would you want to be the, the successor trustee either during while you're alive but incapacitated or after your death? And you want it to be somebody that you trust and know would fulfill your wishes. And then finally, as, as I mentioned before, even though you have a revocable trust, you still need a will um, that's a, what we call a pour over will to capture any assets um, that may not have been transferred into the trust. And you would still need a power of attorney because the, again, the trust can only, the trustee can only uh, manage control assets that are in the trust. But the power of attorney could still manage assets that are outside of the trust. Uh, they could open your mail, believe it or not. You, know, you, you need to give somebody that power and the power of attorney to be able to open your mail, um, which isn't uh, considered in the trust. So you, yes, you still need a will, you still need a power of attorney, you still need a healthcare proxy and those other advanced directives. Um, when you have a trust, but you need a, a, a general overall estate plan to provide for you while you're alive and then after your demise to provide for you and also to provide for your assets and your and essentially uh, manage and, and provide those assets to your loved ones after your demise. So what are the action items? Well, if you have no estate plan at this time, you need to meet with an attorney and prepare one. As we've seen um, this past year, especially with the COVID pandemic, nobody is guaranteed tomorrow. So if you don't have an estate plan, please, please, please meet with an estate planning attorney or a, an elder law attorney to, to put those plans into place. If you don't have a plan, the New York State Legislature has created a plan for you and it's called the Rules of Intestacy. And whether you like it or not, it, that's how your, your state assets will be distributed. And so if there are certain people that you definitely want to provide for or certain people you definitely do not want to provide for but may inherit under the Rules of Intestacy, it's time to, to um, engage in your estate planning. Another action item is make sure your power of attorney and healthcare directive, your healthcare proxy, living will, things of that nature, are up to date and clear and concise. 
Uh, I've seen many people come in that have, I have a power of attorney and their agent is no longer alive or their agent is incapacitated and there's no successor uh, agent listed on the document. Well, then you know what, that document is moot. It's not valid because there's nobody to act. So you wanna make sure that your documents are in place. And if you have an estate planning um, binder or portfolio, look at those documents. And I always tell my clients every three to five years or anytime there's a, a major life change, Look at your documents, make sure they still meet your, your wishes and your desires. You also want to coordinate your beneficiary designations. There are oftentimes people who say, well, I wanna leave everything to my children 50-50, um, but then they have a, a bank account, a joint bank account with child A, who would inherit the entire bank account um, after, by operation of law after mom or dad dies. And now child B is kind of left out in the cold because it was not, their, their plans, their benefit, beneficiary designations were not coordinated. Or maybe you have retirement accounts or, or, or something of the investment accounts where you have beneficiaries, but if, if they're not coordinated, so that way it leaves everything 50-50 or however your wishes are, um, it could create some problems after you're, you've passed away. And while you may not, you may not be here, um, your, your loved ones will definitely feel the, the effects of an improper or, you know, it, unthoughtful uh, estate plan or lack of estate plan. And finally, the, uh, the last action item is if you have an estate plan, have it reviewed periodically. Review it yourself, but also engage in uh, an elder law or trust and state attorney to review that plan, to make sure that it still meets the current tax laws, to make sure that it still meets your, your wishes and your desires, to make sure that, yes, you left everything 50-50 to your children, but since you prepared that document, maybe one of your children is disabled, make sure that, okay, well, maybe we need to do some type of planning for the disabled child so that way they can inherit and not risk them losing their government benefits. And so with that being said, I'm going to pop open the chat to see if there's any questions. If you have any chat questions, please don't hesitate to chat and I will try my best to answer them. Okay, so Mr. Schiller said, with irrevocable trust, will children get a house at stepped up cost if sold before the death? So trusts are, are often used to um, preserve a step up in basis in, in real estate or other um, assets which have in, increased in value over time. And so where you may have bought a house for $100,000 and at the time of your death, it's worth $500,000, your children would get a stepped up basis of that $500,000 value at the time of your death. However, if you sold during your lifetime, there would be no step up in basis um, you would be entitled to your basis uh, in the house, which is $100,000 plus maybe there, you did some improvements or, or additions on the house that would have increased your basis. And then you're also entitled to uh, an increase in the set off of the capital gains uh, for a single individual, 250,000 married couple, $500,000. So in that situation where you bought the house for 100,000, it's now worth 500,000 and the husband and wife were the owners and still the owners, there would be no capital gains because they get a $500,000 increase and the sale price um, would be less than, than the 100 plus 500, $600,000. However, in, in a situation where a single in, individual had a $100,000 basis, and then they get the $250,000 $50, increase, there would still be a capital gains. They wouldn't get the full step up in basis um, if that was sold during the lifetime. So in that case, um, their, their basis would be essentially considered 350,000 and there may be capital gains taxes on that additional $150,000, the difference between 350 and $500,000. What is the best time to change the name of your accounts to the trust? That would depend on the type of the trust. Again, we're talking about irrevocable or revocable, I apologize. We're talking about revocable or living trusts. And so I recommend changing the, the names on those accounts as soon as that account is, is created. Again, it would have to be a type of account that you could transfer into a trust. You can't transfer an IRA or some type of qualified retirement account, something like that, but your bank account or investment accounts, I recommend transfer them, transferring to them as soon as possible. This way they're protected and God forbid something happens to, to you, your trustee can 
your successor trustee or co-trustee can step in and manage those assets while you're alive. Why would I, I, I here's a comment, I already have a will, why would I want to change it to a trust um, or, or possibly both? Again, the, the will provides for distribution of your assets upon your passing. A trust provides for the management of those assets while you're alive, both healthy and incapacitated. It provides for management of those assets after you've passed, perhaps you have minor beneficiaries or, or incapacitated beneficiaries, or perhaps you have, uh, maybe I've had several clients that have children with, uh, with alcohol or, or, or drug problems, some type of substance abuse problems and provides for the management of those assets. So that way the money just doesn't go outright to, to the beneficiary um, upon the decedent's passing. But it also, like a will, provides for the distribution of those estate assets after your passing. It avoids the, the, delay, the delays of probate it avoids the incurred attorney fees of, of probating a will. And it, also where you have, uh, maybe you, you do have a special needs child or a special needs beneficiary and you create a special needs trust in your will, that will is going to be held in, um, in the, with court oversight until the, 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 the termination of that will. Whereas a, a trust or supplemental needs trust created within your revocable trust falls outside of the, the court oversight. So it saves on attorney's fees. It saves on having to file a petition with the court every time you want to make a, a, a large purchase or, or, or something of that nature. So it, it, you're paying a little more for the planning up front now, but you're saving you and or your family and loved ones um, on attorney's fees on the back end. Why doesn't a, a POA allow someone to take care of your finances? Why have a revocable trust for this purposes? A POA allows somebody, it does allow somebody to care for your finances, um, but a POA is only good while you're alive. So immediately upon your passing, your agent can no longer act on your behalf. And therefore then whatever those assets are become part of your estate if you don't have a trust. So the trust allows for, for your, your trustee or to uh, manage and invest and protect those assets while you're alive, but also um, handle those assets after your passing. Uh, POA uh, merely gives somebody the powers, but a, a trust tells them how to invest your property, how to manage your affairs, how your, your assets. And so that's the difference. And as I mentioned, earlier, you still need both. If you have the revocable trust, you still need a power of attorney because there are items that fall outside of the trust. Maybe you, you need to pay POA to, to um, handle certain elections on your retirement accounts. Retirement accounts wouldn't be part of the trust, so you would still need your agent under power of attorney to do that. Um, whereas the trustee can only manage and handle assets that have been um, funded into the trust. How to have a trust hold your home. So when, when you create a trust, and again, for purposes of this discussion, we're talking about revocable trusts, uh, you would need to transfer your home into the trust by preparing, if it's a house or a condo, a deed, um, which transfers the, the, the deed from John Smith to the John Smith revocable trust. Um, you're still entitled to your star exemptions, maybe VA benefit tax exemptions, whatever those, those tax exemptions that you're entitled to on your real estate, you're still entitled to, but you would have to change the, the name of the owner on the title from John Smith to the John Smith Trust. When not to do a trust. Uh, that's a tough one. I, I, I find more and more, especially with everything that happened this year, more and more people are doing trusts because they provide for the immediacy of the distribution of assets or management of assets um, when you become incapacitated or when you pass away. Um, they avoid the long delays of, of the probate process through the court. And I see it more and more people 
are getting fed up with, well, I filed my petition. I, I, when is the court going to respond? And I say, look, look, the courts were closed for three months or so. There's a backlog. And so we've seen more people saying with the backlog we see in the courts and the long delays, they, they moving more towards the revocable trust. So I don't know when there's a thing not to do a, re, a revocable trust. Um, I see it becoming more and more prevalent. And I think it's going to become more and more prevalent as time goes on. Uh, additionally, where you have assets that fall outside of the state of New York, maybe you, you live here in New York, but you have a vacation property in New Jersey. You can provide, uh, you can create this trust and not only fund it with your New York house, but your, your vacation house in New Jersey. So that way upon your passing, Again, now you don't have to do a probate in New York and then an ancillary or secondary probate in New Jersey to handle the New Jersey property. Your trustee can handle all those properties at once um, upon your passing. Do I need to file a separate tax return for a revocable trust? No, as I said before, it's really taking your property from your right pocket and putting it into your left pocket. It's still yours. Um, tax laws still view it as your property and still be um, taxed at your own individual income tax rates. Is a revocable trust outside of probate? Yes, it is. I believe I've gone over that a few times. Should hybrid long-term care policies be placed inside a revocable trust? That's a, a real specific question. And I'd really have to meet with you in, in person or on the phone or whatever to answer that question. So I have a few questions of my own and I don't want to get it too personal with, with that type of question. Um, so Mr. Z, if you wanted to reach out to us, I'd be glad to, to, to consult with you and discuss that question in a little more detail. If a state tax exemptions drop significantly, does it make sense to gift into a trust to reduce the estate taxes? Again, with revocable trusts, um, the property that is in there does not reduce your uh, estate taxes. With revocable trusts, anything that's in there is part of your gross estate and taxable at the time of your death. There are other options. We're still waiting to see what happens with this election. And then that will determine what happens with, with the tax laws and state tax laws going forward. Um, but do stay tuned to our website where we post articles quite often on the upcoming changes of law. And as we get a little more clear picture of what happens and what the planning techniques are, we're always writing articles or even hosting programs like this Lunch and Learn or other similar webinars or zoom -inars, um, to discuss these changes in laws. But with the unknown of, of what's gonna happen next week or the months following, because I doubt we will know as of um, next week who, who the new president's going to be, um, we'll have a clearer picture and can start um, looking forward to, to what planning techniques are available for our clients. Uh, how much more expensive is a trust over a will? This really depends on the complexity uh, of your trust and, and, and the terms of your trust. So we'd really need to sit and meet and determine what your your goals are, what your distributees are, uh, things of that nature, determine the real complex, how complex, and even a will quite often could be quite complex. People come in and say, I have, a, I have a basic simple will and we start delving into it. And well, I have a grandchild with, that they wanna leave money to that has special needs or they wanna leave to a charity. And so really, either a will and or a trust both really determine, determine the price determine on the complexity um, of the will and, and the work required. Mm -hmm. is, finally, I see one last question that I will let you all go because we're nearing the end of the hour is, is there a minimum asset level recommended for revocable trusts? And what is your view on joint living trusts? There is no minimum asset level for, for revocable trusts. Uh, if, if you've got an estate that's going to pass through the, through the courts via through intestacy or through a will probate, then you've got an estate that can be protected by a revocable trust. Um, so there is no um, minimum limit. And quite often there are people that will create revocable trusts and fund them minimally, um, but know that they are there to 
receive benefits or receive inheritances or, 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 or uh, retirement accounts or, or life insurance policies for their children later on. Um, that is one of the planning techniques. But again, what we really discussed today was more, more or less the use of prote protecting you while you're alive. And then even after you pass away through these trusts and protecting and providing for the management of your assets. And then what is our view on joint living trusts? Lately, we've been going away from the joint living trusts um, for various reasons. Maybe husband and wife set up a joint living trust and they, they get divorced. Now that's something that we've got to discuss and maybe revoke this trust. And now you spent all this money creating a trust um, that you're now revoking because you're going through a divorce. There's also issues um, with, well, if it's a joint trust, who's the, who is the person that's going to be taxed? Is it going under the husband's tax um, social security number, the wife's social security number? Maybe you have joint accounts or you each have your own individual accounts that are now being held in the trust as joint trusts and it just creates a, a, a makes you scratch your head and say okay wait now whose property is this is this the husband's is the wife's and, and, and it just creates a a puzzle that could be avoided by look husband you have set up your your revocable trust wife you set up your revocable trust we have two separate revocable trusts um, but you could both be co-trustees on your own trusts um, it makes it a little clearer and makes it um easier to handle later on. So we're not a big fan of doing joint living trusts. There is a rare occasion. I, I think there's always the, 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 the lawyer joke of the question you ask a lawyer where we say, well, it depends. Well, it depends. But for the most part, um, we're not in favor of, of joint living trusts. Uh, we do prefer individual living trusts or individual revocable trusts. So with that being said, I, we're near the end of the hour. I want to thank you all for your questions. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can reach me, bmiller at littmancrooks.com. Check our website. We're, we're constantly posting, posting articles and updates on the changes of law. If you would like to schedule a consultation, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can find us at littmancrooks.com. You could call, call our office at 914-684-2100. And look forward to our future Lunch with Littman Crooks programs. Again, we don't have one next week because it's election day, but following November 10th, we are going to do a Lunch with Littman Crooks with Laura Brancato from our office, who's going to be discussing mental health and the law. And that's really regarding providing for people with incapacities, guardianships, and things of that nature. Thank you all. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with me and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Take care.